Hello, my name is Priya Winston, and today I'll be discussing skill development and employment of neurodiverse young adults, specifically what research says about it. At age 14, I was diagnosed with a genetic condition called Turner syndrome, which also came with a learning difference. I had the opportunity to work with experts in the field who said that I should not hope for college, employment, or driving, all things which I dreamed of for my life. This led me to an interest in this work specifically social work. I'm a licensed master's social worker in the state of New York, and I'm the director of curriculum and clinical supports for a post-secondary education program called Transitions. And this program supports young adults with the goals of going to college, entering the workforce, and living on your own for the first time, away from your childhood home and your family. I also decided to pursue my PhD at SUNY Albany's School of Social Welfare. My dissertation research focuses on gender difference in employment outcomes for young adults with developmental disabilities participating in a post-secondary education program. And I will be discussing much of that research with you today. As of right now, I am scheduled to defend my dissertation and complete my PhD by the end of this year, December, 2023. I also have a dog named Jazzy, a fun, interesting fact, which I thought I would share with you. Now, why is this topic important? Why does it matter? So according to the US Department of Labor in 2023, 40% of individuals with disabilities ages 20 to 24 participated in the workforce as compared to 70.4% of people in the same age group with no disability diagnosis. And this also does not account for a plethora of other factors such as family income, geographic region, gender, race, education, et cetera. The good news is that uh, this 40% is an increase from 2020 when the pandemic began. However, as you can see, it's still quite unequal to the 70.4% of people without a disability diagnosis. So in this presentation, I want to discuss with you what the current research says about what skills are needed for young neurodiverse people to succeed in the workforce and how they can obtain these skills and how this is different than other young people. Yes, I think anyone who may or may not have a disability diagnosis could benefit from learning some of the skills which I will discuss prior to entering adulthood. However, there is a specific need for individuals who are neurodiverse, and that is something I'm going to discuss today as well. And then another factor which I wanted to talk about, which I found fascinating because this came up as I was looking for literature on factors for my dissertation research. And that is a quality 
called resilience. And this came up as an important factor for people with disabilities to succeed in the workforce and in their careers. And I wanted to share a little bit about what research has to say about that as well. So for my research, I conducted a mixed methods evaluation of a post-secondary education program. I gathered data from 30 out of 51 of the students in the program who agreed to be interviewed about their experiences by a research assistant who worked with me. These 30 participants also agreed to complete an anonymous online survey about their experience in the program as well. The data from the surveys and the interviews indicated that self-advocacy and social skills were crucial for success with employment. And they attributed their participation in the post-secondary education program and the internships that they had the opportunity to do as a part of this program as the reasons why they learned these skills and achieved success. Now, self-advocacy. According to the study published in the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation, they defined self-advocacy as four pieces. This includes knowledge of self, understanding your strengths and the areas that are challenging for you. This also includes understanding your rights. This includes examples such as in this country, you are protected against discrimination based on disability diagnosis. Communication, conversational skills, building relationships, conflict resolution, leadership, motivating others, working with a team, and influencing a larger group. This study found that participating in a training and practice opportunities to better your skills with self-advocacy and improve on these four areas led to better outcomes like employment and independent living. In other words, learning self-advocacy skills made people more likely to get jobs and live on their own. Now, when I was in school a little over a decade ago, this was not taught to young people in schools. When I started my work at Transitions, I had the opportunity to develop a research-based course on this topic called Self-Discovery and Leadership. This was reviewed by Dr. Stacy Carr of Virginia Commonwealth University's Autism Center of Excellence. And she is also now a member of my dissertation committee. And now looking at this research all these years later, it makes sense as to why I saw that this course was so beneficial for the students in the transitions program. And there is also a study conducted in the Rehabilitation Counseling Bulletin, which also had findings that showed that self-advocacy skills and social skills were necessary for employment readiness of young neurodiverse people. Now, as you may see on the screen, there's a quote that I always include in the course that I mentioned earlier. 
and that I share with students in the transitions program. And it says, everyone regardless of ability or disability has strengths and weaknesses. Know what yours are, build on your strengths, and find a way around your weaknesses. And this was said by a gentleman named Brad Cohen, an accomplished author who also happens to have Tourette syndrome. Another area which I mentioned, social skills were found to be extremely critical for success in employment. A study published by researchers in Canada and Australia found that social challenges were a barrier to employment for people with autism. They interviewed 29 people in the workforce who identified as having an autism diagnosis from all over the world. And they also interviewed 15 supervisors of individuals with autism, also from all over the world. They completed open-ended survey question responses. And from these responses, they identified two categories of social skills that they felt were critical. The work task challenges include learning the protocol of communication and interpretation of the behavior of people in the workforce. For example, how do you talk to your coworker if you're working on a project and you need help? How do you know if it's okay to ask them? If there's a hierarchy, how do you know who to go to if there's an issue? And the other involved work event related social skills, knowing the etiquette rules of what topics to speak about or rules for eating food. For example, how do you know what food is okay to bring to an office potluck? How do you know what topics are okay to speak about with coworkers or your boss at a work party? And what topics are not that might get you into some trouble with HR? And that's basically what they were referring to. Now, if it's so important to learn these skills, how can young people learn them? And a study published in a journal known as Behavior Modification talked about post-secondary education programs and why these are so important for young people to learn these skills. But not just any post-secondary education program. They have to be inclusive, accessible to all neurodiverse people of all different abilities and learning styles, academic focused, classroom instruction, employment oriented, focused on preparing people for work and the career that they want. And they have to promote legitimate evaluations of their programs to see if these programs are effectively achieving desired outcomes for participants. And this is why I wanted to conduct my dissertation research. This is why this helps us understand are these programs effectively preparing young neurodiverse people for the life and the career and the education that they want? And another study published in the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation 
also talked about how post-secondary education is an effective way to teach self-advocacy and social skills. And it included a literature review of 25 studies which evaluated post-secondary education programs and employment readiness programs. And the majority increased the likelihood of paid employment for program participants. Another important piece was internships. The business internship model was found to increase the likelihood of employment success and independence. I found this fascinating because many post-secondary education programs like the one that I work for, Transitions, specifically offers internship opportunities. A final factor which I found fascinating when I was doing my dissertation research, this was something that came up. And it's the concept of resilience. And resilience is defined as adaptation in the context of severe adversity. So not giving up, essentially. A study developed in the UK found that young adults from low-income households were most likely to achieve employment success and independence if their measurement for resilience was high. And researchers at the University of Washington's Medical Center also found that resilience was a predictive factor in employment. These researchers recommended that further study conducted should be conducted to assess this in combination with other socioeconomic factors as well. I found this fascinating and I just wanted to research this further, the concept of resilience. So if you take all this into consideration, what can you do? Attend local school board meetings and advocate for these skills to be taught in the curriculum. Attend local political events where people are speaking about the need for young neurodiverse people to receive funding so they can attend post-secondary education programs or schools can receive funding so they can teach and offer curriculum to teach these skills. And for the investment of post-secondary education programs in your community, research to see if post-secondary education programs are available in your area. If you're a parent or guardian of a young neurodiverse person, speak to your child's care or case manager about a post-secondary education program after high school. You could also speak to other professionals at their school about this as well. If you are a qualified clinical or educational professional who works with young neurodiverse people, consider how you can instill these skills into the people that you work with or provide resources to them to help them build these skills? Are there resources in your area that you can refer them to? Can you obtain more training or education in this area so that you can equip young neurodiverse people with these skills? And what is needed? 
And I think all of this will be a very tall order. But I think if everyone can play a part in this, it can be done. Education of employers, government officials, educational professionals, and society as a whole on what, what is needed for neurodiverse people and the benefit of neurodiverse people in colleges and in the workforce, how that can benefit the world. This is not just to benefit them. They can be a benefit to everyone else. And that's where embracing our differences as a society can come in, right? Many people learn, think, and act differently than others. And that's okay. In fact, that's a good thing that we should embrace. If you're an employer, I encourage you to give people who may seem a little bit different an opportunity to interview. Or if you're an administrative professional at a college or university, I encourage you to find a way to ensure that people who are submitting applications that may not seem like the norm, that they get a chance, not simply out of niceness or simply because someone has a disability diagnosis, but again, because of the fact that they could benefit you. To not write them off because they are different. More research is also needed on the employment of neurodiverse young people and factors that contribute to successful outcomes for this. Here I have included a list of resources that you might find helpful. On top is the link to a website for a program called Peers, which was developed from the University of California in Los Angeles. And Dr. Liz Logason has founded a program which offers social skills training to adolescents and young adults with neurodiversity. They offer training to professionals who want to offer this to people in their areas. And they also have information for classes for any parents or families who would like their children to take these courses. The next link is a link to the website for the transitions program. And the next one is the federal government's educational department website about transitioning to adulthood. And then finally, the last link is a link to the Learning Disability Association of America's website uh, with a specific link to information about post-secondary education programs. And this is a list of of all the articles which referenced the studies that I discussed in this presentation. This will be made available to you as well as my contact information so should you wish to reach out to me and ask any questions. I would encourage you to do so and hope to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope it was beneficial to you and helpful. And I wish you safety and wellness. Thank you.